to get your news on. We are VK1 WIA. Yes, it's time. June 4, 2023 edition of the WIA National News. WIA Director Chris VK3FY with very important news on an upcoming webinar dealing with club insurance. Justin VK7TW tells us of the celebrations which started Thursday last for 100 years of amateur radio in VK7. WIA Editor-in-Chief of Amateur Radio Magazine wets our appetite by telling us what's in store in the latest greatest amateur radio magazine under the Southern Cross. And remember VK90AR for the 90 years of the WIA's journal Amateur Radio Magazine is available as a special call sign for you to activate. And hard news from VK6. From the WIA, I'm Editor Graham, VK4BB. No, you haven't tuned the ether stirrer. This is the official VK Ham News from the one... We are VK1 WIA. WIA VK7 Centenary. A huge thank you to the WIA board for their support of this event that happens throughout the month of June 2023. For those who have taken a sneak peek at the digital version of the May-June edition of AR Magazine, it contains a humorous summary history of organised amateur radio in VK7. And there is a quote from the auspicious magazine The Listener In from the 14th of March 1925 and it appears in the wireless club section and I quote the Hobart Radio Experimenters Club is a strong body of wireless enthusiasts the club was once known as the Wireless Institute but a split occurred and in the course of which some blood was spilt and a black eye told its tale and the new body was formed with the donor of the black eye as president the Wireless Institute is still in existence but in a rather negative state at the moment unquote and thanks to Richard VK7RO for all the research into that wonderful article there will be a number of VK7 focused articles over the rest of 2023 AR magazines. Now listen out throughout the month of June for the special call sign VK7 WIA and there will be a special QSL card and award certificate and take a look at the link on the email edition of this broadcast for details. There will also be open days around VK7 in June incorporating media opportunities, historical displays and special operating days. In the northwest there will be an open day on Saturday the 24th of June in the north an open day on Saturday the 17th of June and in the south the open day is on Saturday the 10th of June and see the website for more information we hope to hear you on air or in person during the month of June to celebrate the WIA VK7 Centenary Month and it's 73 from yours truly Justin VK7 Tango Whiskey on behalf of the VK7 Centenary Committee this is Chris Dimitrievich VK3 FY on behalf of the Board of the Wireless Institute of Australia for VK1 WAA National News. Today's topics. 1. Peter Young, VK3 MV, Regulatory Council. 2. Amateur Radio Club Insurance. Topic 1. Peter Young, VK3 Mike Victor, has advised at the Board that he will be stepping down as the WA Regulatory Council to allow him to spend more time on family matters. The WA Board wishes to thank Peter for his time as the WAA Regulatory Council. In addition, the WA Board wishes to advise that it will be seeking a suitable candidate to fill the role as WA Regulatory Council and seeks expressions of interest from WAA members. Topic 2. Amateur Radio Club Insurance The Wireless Institute of Australia has for many years arranged a discounted insurance scheme for affiliated clubs by an insurance broker. This insurance was very limited in its coverage and the board felt that in response to a number of requests from affiliated clubs that an option for additional insurance coverage be made available to clubs. With so many affiliated clubs, the WAA will issue an invitation to club presidents and secretaries to join us on a webinar. The webinar will be recorded for clubs to replay to other members in their own time. Invitations to WA affiliated clubs will go out within the next week. Questions may be submitted ahead of time by email and details will be advised in the invitation email. This has been Chris, VK3FY, on behalf of the Board of the Wireless Institute of Australia for VK1 WAA National News. This is Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH. 
editor-in-chief of Amateur Radio magazine. I am reliably informed that members have been receiving their copies and downloading their electronic issues for more than a week now. Meanwhile, the editor-in-chief has to maintain his patience. I intimated on my last broadcast that there was more to come. Hands up those of you with a 2 metre rig or dual band 2 metre 70 centimetre rig in your car. Being able to chat with other parameters during the daily commute or when on long drives through the countryside is great stuff. These days you can play with old style analogue FM or the digital spin-offs, all those acronyms, C4FM, DMR, D-Star, etc. Ever thought about how our brothers and sisters in Western Australia cope with the vast distances between inhabited centres in that state? Well, our West News colonist, Will McGee, VK6UU, is back in the latest issue with further news on development of the All Star Network over there. This time it's about a new All Star node installed in Waluna. Waluna? Where's that? Turn to page 11 and read all about it. Okay. Who knew that the Secretary-General of the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, held an amateur radio licence? Doreen Bogdan-Martin, KD2JTX, holds that illustrious job, which is important because the ITU organises the regular world radio conferences. We have one coming up in November. That determine the international rules and treaties for the use of the radio frequency spectrum. Doreen recently found time to play a little amateur radio, chasing DX via the geostationary amateur radio satellite known as QO100. Read all about it on page 5, with pictures. She's the lady in the pink suit. All the blokes are in grey, wouldn't you know? Apart from one bloke who didn't get the memo and wore his jeans to work that day. Don't miss this issue's book review. The book is War Diaries, a radio amateur in Kiev. After all that's written and shown in the mass media, here's a personal story of one man in Ukraine, helping others as best he can. Amateur Radio Magazine, Volume 91, Issue Number 3 for 2023. Serving Australian radio amateur dudes for 90 years and still ploughing on. Available in print and online, always published to a schedule, never random or half-heartedly slapped together. Thanks for listening. I'm Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH for VK1WIA News. CW Hard. Last week we told you how Richard Eyre, VK6PZT, would be on ABC National TV, where he had to answer questions and even trade gently disparaging remarks with the host. Hard quiz Wednesday TV fans watched Richard square off in the Melbourne studio against three other contestants. So how did he score as a contestant? He won, he won, he won. So now, instead of just pounding the brass, he'll be drinking from it. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1 WIA. Now, international news with VK2 LAW Jason. Hello, leading this week's international news from Region 1 to Rome. Yes, for our first story, it's off to ancient Rome in Italy for an out-of-this-world project. Compete to decipher message from Mars. A competition to decode a message from Mars that reached Earth on the evening of May 24 has started. The data collected by radio telescopes have already been processed and made available online at the website of the project, A Sign in Space. The signal, which simulates a message sent by an extraterrestrial civilization, was transmitted via the Trace Gas Orbiter Probe of the ExoMars mission in orbit around Mars. In the space of a few hours, more than 1,300 people from all over the world took up this challenge, an experiment on the margins between science, art and science fiction. According to the INAF, National Astrophysics Institute, which set it up from an idea from the artist Daniela de Paulus in collaboration with the European Space Agency, the SETI Institute and the Green Bank Observatory. Ham Radio is the place where radio enthusiasts from all over the world meet. The 46th show will take place from 23rd to the 25th of June, 
Ham Radio 2023 is a highly anticipated event with over 150 exhibitors and 14,000 members of the amateur radio community catching up in Friedrichshafen, Germany. The IARU have put out a note to Hams Worldwide who will be lucky enough to attend, and I quote in full. Step by the IARU Open Innovation Zone, where we invite you to explore exciting projects from our community. From software-defined radio to powerful digital signal processing tools and captivating citizen science initiatives, you'll witness the future of amateur radio unfold before your eyes. Active members of our community will introduce you to their projects, expertise and inspiring stories that will ignite your imagination and propel you into your own exciting radio adventures. Discover the possibilities, connect with fellow enthusiasts and be a part of a revolution that pushes the boundaries of amateur radio. So join us at the IARU Open Innovation Zone, where innovation meets passion and together we'll reshape the future of amateur radio. Good words indeed, and a great initiative from the IARU at the Ham Radio 2023 to be held this month in Germany. To news from Region 2, ARRL and FEMA sign agreement, Ham Radio is as relevant as ever. The agreement emphasises the importance of skilled amateur radio operators in times of crisis and the role of ARIS leadership within the emergency communications space. ARIS is a network of trained amateur radio service licensees organised across the country to provide communications and other support to served agencies, such as local governments, hospitals and disaster relief charities. More than 20,000 ARIS volunteers actively participate in the ARRL program. In 2022, they provided more than 420,000 labour hours of service, saving local officials $13.4 million in personnel costs. Each member of ARIS has specialised training in emergency communications. Many have also completed training in the National Incident Management System in order to integrate with local officials during an emergency response. The agreement is representative of the continued commitment and cooperation between FEMA and ARRL, said ARRL Director of Emergency Management, Josh Johnson, Kilo Echo 5, Mike Hotel Victor. Serving our country during emergencies is an important service provided by ARIS volunteers and a principal purpose of our amateur radio service. Our well-equipped volunteers bring their training, use of innovative technologies and community partnerships together to serve before and during disasters. To Region 3, Guamanian broadcasters have met with the Office of Civil Defence Administrator and the Communications Director for Government to determine how to restore communications across the island in the wake of Typhoon Mawa. According to a report in the Pacific Daily News, radio and television stations were largely knocked off the air by the storm and the territorial government is working to help stations get back on the air quickly. Power was the primary issue, according to stations during the meeting. The media representatives asked the governor's office to help stations secure diesel fuel and working generators to keep stations broadcasting until power is restored. KUAM-TV have reported efforts to restore power across the island with a focus on critical infrastructure. Hospitals, wells, wastewater facilities and telecommunications are taking place. Guam will get our radio stations back online, but we are a bit in the dark, you know, with no radio communications, so people of Guam are very anxious for information. The report noted that K-Stereo, the primary radio station designated to relay 24-7 information from the government during emergencies, remains off the air because it lacks power and its generator isn't working. Finally, this week it's to New Zealand, where our Kiwi brethren are taking part in the 97th NZART Annual Conference and AGM in Palmerston North over the King's birthday. The conference commenced on Saturday the 3rd of June at 9am and concludes Sunday 4th of June after the evening dinner. So many activities and lectures, an alternative program is being run on both days. For VK1 WIA National News, in Sydney, I'm Jason, VK2LAW. We are VK1 WIA. Now, operational news with VK4 FUQ. Felix. Hello there. Now, contest wise, June weekend prior to the second Monday of June, VK Shires. 
so if your calendar is the same as mine, that makes the shires June 10 and 11. Also make a mental note that the 2023 QRPA happens June 17. June 24-25, winter, VHF, UHF field day. Calling all VHFers, UHFers and microwavers. As that old poem begins, the time has come, the walrus said. OK, no walrus, just me. Roger Harrison, VK, 2ZRH, erstwhile manager of the VHF, UHF field days. I'm here to advise that the midwinter field day for 2023, as planned, runs over Saturday the 24th of June through to Sunday the 25th. As in the past, you will find the dates, the times and the rules posted on the WAA website. As everyone is aware, we have been working on catching up with preparing results of last year's contests and this year's summer event, last January. A number of people have made valiant efforts over recent months to find or to write suitable log checking software to suit these unique contests that have been developed by the stakeholders over time. It's proven to be a Herculean task and I'm truly grateful to those volunteers who have taken it on. Let them rest for the moment or so and I urge you just get out there, enjoy the outdoors or the indoors at home and have fun then send us a log. AI is not yet up to the task. I heard what you were thinking. Meanwhile, I have returned to compiling contest results manually. That means by hand, not by a Spaniard, as Basil Fawlty thought. This is Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH, for VK1WIA News. The NZART Memorial Contest has been held every year since 1946 to commemorate those New Zealand amateur radio operators who lost their lives in World War II. The contest is held every year on the Saturday and Sunday of the first weekend in July. The 2023 Memorial Contest dates are the 1st and 2nd of July. IARU HF World Championship Contest takes place the second full weekend of July, beginning 1200 hours UDC Saturday and ending 1200 hours UDC Sunday, July 8 and 9. All licensed amateurs worldwide are eligible to participate in this contest as the objective is to contact as many other amateurs as possible, especially IAA member society HQ stations around the world, using the 160, 80, 40, 20, 15 and 10 metre bands. July 15, Trans has been leaving contest. August 12 and 13, Remembrance Day contest. August 26, 27, Alara contest. Dex window. The Northern California DX Foundation is preparing to offer $100,000 US dollars in grants to help mitigate deliberate interference in amateur radio activities. NCDXF will entertain grant proposals from individuals and or groups that specifically outline their approach to identify bad actors. A group of directors will weigh the probability of success of these proposals as well as monitor the progress of the grantees. These Aussie special calls on air are worth listening for, to year's end. But you may also be able to operate these calls if you are an affiliated WIA club. The booking portal is accessed on a WIA home page. VI10 VKFF celebrates the 10-year anniversary of the VKFF group. VI100 MB celebrates the centenary year of the Manly Ringa Radio Society. VK9AR for 90 years of the WIA's journal, Amateur Radio Magazine. VK100ZL celebrates his centenary of the first trans Tasman radio contact between Australia and New Zealand. Again, until December 31, and speaking of VK100ZL, a special event call sign, ZL100, has been issued for three months to the NZART to commemorate the event, commencing 26 April to 25 July. For VK1WIA National News, I'm Felix VK4FUQ in From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1WIA. Now, special interest group news with VK3GTV. Call. Hello, first up, it's Worldwide Special Interest Group's CW. Build a three-transistor radio via CW. This South African activity took place between Saturday the 27th of May and yesterday, Saturday the 3rd of June. Your task, if you are in ZS land and chose to accept, 
was to order parts and build just one radio. Parts could come from different amateurs, and swapping parts is the name of the game. Therefore, the aim is to have all the parts you would need in one place within seven days, giving you time to accommodate and collect components. Parts ordered from other amateurs by CW must be shown in the comments section of the community logger. ZS hams have a password to the logger. Happy shopping and swapping, but it all must be done using CW. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Final Frontier. A new distance record is being claimed on SO50. During a SOTA activation of Pine Mountain in Michigan on May 24th, Joe Worth, KE9AJ, worked George Munji, MI0ILE, in Northern Ireland. The distance between the two locations is 5,584 kilometres. A previous record on this satellite was 5,523 kilometres, set in 2018. Four CubeSats developed by the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute were not IARU coordinated, and the downlink of one of the satellites is on 437.800 MHz. This has the potential to cause QRM to the ISSFM repeater. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Maritime. Fleet Week New York is in its fourth decade of celebrating the sea services, with the New York Council Navy League there every step of the way. U.S. Navy vessels have been visiting New York City in a celebratory manner since the aftermath of the Spanish-American War in 1898, when Commodore Dewey was celebrated as the hero of the Battle of Manila Bay. However, the first official Fleet Week took place in New York City in 1988 and is generally timed to coincide with the Memorial Day holiday weekend. Fleet Week is an unparalleled opportunity for the citizens of New York and the surrounding areas to meet sailors, marines and coast guardsmen, as well as witness firsthand the latest capabilities of today's maritime services. Many of those visiting were on air on the local VHF UHF ham channels and were made welcome to the area by local ham radio operators. Navy League values and honours those who uphold the traditions of the maritime services. June 3 and 4 marks the annual Museum Ships Weekend Amateur Radio event, during which amateur radio operators around the world commemorate the service of historic ships by operating from ship memorials, museums or the actual ships themselves. Here in VK, you can contact HMAS Vampire. Listen out for Victor Kilo 2, Victor Mike Papa in Sydney and check out the VK2 VMP page on qrz.com. HMAS Vampire is moored at the Australian National Maritime Museum. The Montrose Amateur Radio Club in the USA will operate from the USS Montrose Memorial on both days. This is the fifth year that the USS Montrose Memorial will participate. The event encourages ham radio operators to contact as many of the participating museum ships as possible, learn the history of the ships contacted, and commemorate both the ships and those who served on them and there are more than 90 ships participating this year. It's across to the west, and that gentleman of the airwaves in VK6, Clive, VK6 CSW. The Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia's June Bulletin goes to air tomorrow. Firstly, something different. 10 metre conditions are excellent, and we will conduct a one-off experiment tomorrow. In place of the usual 20 metre transmission at zero hours UTC, Mike, VK8MA, will transmit the bulletin on 28.450 MHz with 400 watts beamed southeastward. All who can are asked to listen and report Mike's signals. That's 28.450 megs starting at zero hours UTC. Please give it a go. All other transmission times remain as published on our website. This month's features are Club News by Andrew, VK3CAH, an item about Guy Gibson, the famous dam buster. Then Bill, VK3BR, tells us about the Eiffel Tower and its early radio installations. Everyone's welcome to listen to the program and join in the callbacks afterwards. If none of the transmission times suit you, you can download the audio file at any time from today from the website. The next lunchtime meeting for members and friends in Perth is on Tuesday, June the 13th at the Woodbridge Hotel, East Guildford. All are welcome. See the website for details. So tune in tomorrow 
For the RAOTC June Bulletin, if possible, listen on 10 metres at 0 hours UTC and please join in the callbacks afterwards. 73 from Clive, VK6CSW. And from the oldies to our young timer, Alec, VK2APC, with an update on Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Radio Amateur Young Timers. Yota. Do you know that the Radio Society of Great Britain's School Zone webpage brings together radio amateurs in schools and colleges? This great initiative helps people to share their experience of and expertise in establishing and running a radio club for young people. And just launched is a new page as part of the section called School Zone Stories, where they highlight some of the great amateur radio activities that are happening today in schools across the United Kingdom. And in the USA, it's graduation season for high schools across the United States, which brings a graduation cap decorated with a call sign. This rite of passage is often accompanied by the chance for graduates to decorate their caps for the festivities, and one teenage ham in Oklahoma chose to decorate hers with her call sign. Cassie Whetstone, KI5DBQ, is a graduate in the Magnum High School class of 2023. She was also a part of the school's Tiger Radio Club, KF5CRF, through which she earned her license. Her graduation cap was decorated with monarch butterflies and a bright floral design on each corner. Sparkly rhinestones lined the cap's edges, and 73's KI5DBQ Clear was printed down the center. See a bigger photo of the cap and leave your well wishes for Cassie on the ARL Facebook page. And in Australia, a follow-up on Emil and his family. As you may recall, I spoke about Emil, VK5WWW, who was 11. It turns out his sisters, Josie, 13, and Nina, 16, earned their foundation license in early 2022 in Adelaide with a great helper, Paul, VK5PH. Since then, they have all trekked up mountains and into parks to activate portable for summits on the air and worldwide flora and fauna. Emil has continued to have fun with the CW game Morse Zap, and he jumps on air to play QRS CW, chasing parks and summit operators. His next goal is to compete a CW-only WWFF and soda activation. For VK1WIA National News, I'm Alec, VK2APC in Sydney. Now back over to you, Cole. Thanks, Alec. Next up, it's Worldwide Special Interest Group's Rescue Radio. When all else fails... Yes, we hams know that one. The use of amateur radio to maintain communication. Well, according to CBS News in the USA, their government has begun issuing satellite phones to over 50 senators in preparation for a potential disruptive event. The news has ignited a wave of concern and speculation about the real reason behind the move. Senators were told to keep these satellite phones within arm's reach during their travels. The phones are meant to ensure emergency communication channels remain intact if a crisis severely impacts the regular communication infrastructure. The Department of Homeland Security has also issued an advisory highlighting the significance of satellite phones during man-made or natural disasters that cause widespread communication breakdowns. For VK1WIA National News, I'm Cole, VK3GTV, this week at Snowy Mount Buller. 2023 social scene and remember clubs are welcome to submit text with audio for this section. Details of all WIA affiliated clubs and societies can be found on wia.org.au and that includes email addresses, website links, etc, etc. I'm Henry, VK2ZHE, President of the Oxley Region Amateur Radio Club. The Oxley Region Amateur Radio Club's 47th Annual Field Day at the Warhope Showground Hall is next weekend on Saturday and Sunday, the 10th and the 11th of June, during the New South Wales King's Birthday long weekend. There will be all the usual field day activities, including traders, trash and treasure, fox hunting and a homebrew display. The field day dinner will be at the Port Macquarie Golf Club on the Saturday night. The Woolhope Showground permits camping, so it's possible to stay on site in your own motorhome, caravan or tent, with power and amenities, but you must book ahead with the showground caretaker. Thanks, Henry. Now, to VK5, the CERG convention, the Fox Hunting Championships, also next weekend, June 10 and 11. And in VK5, Amateur Radio Experimenters Group Radio and Electronics Sale happens November 26. 
Now, till next we meet, I'm Graham VK4BB. Walk softly. From Australia, this has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5BD's ATV and YouTube channel, this has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like. Greetings, listeners. This is VK3 OTN, the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia, with this month's news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club for June 2023. I am Andrew, a VK3 Charlie Alpha Hotel. Details on when to hear the news and information bulletins are available at the club's website, www. Dot .raotc.org.au VK3 ATN is available on a wide range of radio platforms HF, VHF and UHF along with 2 metre repeaters, amateur television, DMR that is digital mobile radio and D-Star These news broadcasts are available for download for up to 6 months just in case you missed the original news broadcast from the RAOTC website. Just put RAOTC into your favourite search engine. If you'd like to contact the club, then why not send us an email? Our address is raotc at raotc.org.au. I hope you enjoy this month's news broadcast. Welcome to the June 2023 edition of RAOTC Club News. We have still not received any offers to edit ATN or offers to do the desktop publishing. We have a number of members who have offered to do proofreading. We welcome the offers of proofreading, but we need one or more editors so that we have a journal to proofread. No editor equals no magazine, which equals nothing to proofread. At a pinch, it would be helpful if someone would step forward to assist Bill Raper if they're not willing to take on the whole role. If editing and desktop publishing were outsourced to a commercial entity, the costs incurred would be prohibitive. We often have a number of regular contributors and we have a good printer. More about this a little later on, however. The committee can organise the mailing out of the printed journal, so the editor only has to process articles that have been contributed and produce a small number of articles for proofreading. The next step is then for someone to do the laying out of the journal. Laying out in years past was called typesetting and was done by the printer. These days it is done electronically on a desktop computer and a file is created and sent to the printer, usually via email. This step is now called desktop publishing. Broadcasts. Last time I spoke I mentioned that I did not intend to produce a broadcast 11 times a year. Unfortunately no one has stepped forward as yet. I had a bit of a thought bubble over the Easter break when the weather was definitely along the lines of a stay indoors here in Melbourne. I'm providing a broadcast each alternate month. I feel that something needs to go out every month, as do others I've spoken to. There will be a broadcast every odd-numbered month, offering an historical broadcast from years past. So we are back to 11 broadcasts a year. There are other sources of material, for example, the ABC, BBC, ARRL and RSGB. However, copyright and permissions need to be observed. This is a work in progress. Please stand by. In order to add a little more variety, I've added Natasha and William to the broadcast team. They don't have a call sign yet, but we're working on it. They are a bit of an experiment, but earlier reports seem positive. Suggestions made to committee. Often the ROTC committee receives suggestions on how to enhance and improve the club via the email inbox. These are always welcome and arrive at discussed via email amongst committee members or via the quarterly Zoom teleconference meeting. We do our best to acknowledge and reply to all emails. We do this in our own free time as part of our hobby. Many times the suggestions are simply not practical, although the original intention is good. I'll point out several examples. 
One suggestion was to record the technical talks at the twice yearly Melbourne luncheon and put them on the web for others who were unable to attend to listen to at their leisure. On the surface, it sounds like a pretty good idea. At the time, we had a limited amount of space on the web server. However, that issue has been addressed. Many of the talks these days use a slideshow presentation to enhance the talk. Just recording the audio and providing it without the slideshow would lose most of the impact of the talk. That's a simple reason as to why it's not done. Another member recently wrote suggesting the committee organise barbecues and luncheons in cities Australia-wide and thrown a bit money to kick the event off. The few members that are on committee have enough to do in their spare time. If you would like to see this and you can organise it, we'll publish the details for other club members. Yet another idea was a buy, swap and sell forum. I'm not too sure if this was going to be in the magazine or online. What wasn't clear it was who was actually going to do the task and how it would offer something better and improved over what VK Classifieds and or eBay currently provide. Committee News At the recent committee meeting held via teleconference on the 25th of May, both David, a VK3 ADM, and John, a VK3 XM, tendered their resignation and advised they would be standing down from the committee due to ongoing health issues. Let's wish them both all the best into the future and in recent times they were instrumental in securing a new venue for the Melbourne RAOTC luncheons. New Members Today I am pleased to welcome the following new members to the RAOTC. Patrick Morgan, a VK5 Mike Papa Juliet, became RAOTC Associate Member number 1851 on the 6th of March 2023. Peter Westgarth, a VK3 Alpha Papa Whiskey, previous call sign a VK3 Tango Radio Echo, became new RAOTC full member number 1852 on the 29th of March 2023. John Payne, a VK3 Alpha Echo Delta, Previous call sign, VK3 Zulu Lima Papa, became new RAOTC full member number 1853 on the 28th of April 2023. And finally, Greg Todd, VK7 Yankee Alpha Delta, became new RAOTC full member number 1854 on the 3rd of May 2023. Silent Keys. I regret to report the following silent keys. Max Morris, a VK3 GMM, RAATC member 1265, became a silent key on the 6th of April 2023. Mark Busanik, a VK6 AR, RAATC member 1334, became a silent key on Wednesday the 3rd of May 2023. Let us pause in memory of our departed colleagues. <laughs> Members are reminded the very latest club news is available via the RATC website. Put RATC into your favourite search engine to find it. www.ratc.org Dot au, And that's about all the club news we have for you at this time. You are listening to VK3 OTN. VK3 OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club Australia Incorporated with the monthly news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club. This month we have several interesting articles for you. First up is Clive, VK6 CSW who will be talking about Guy Gibson, who led air raids over Germany during World War II. This will be followed by Bill, VK3BR, who tells us about the Eiffel Tower and its early radio. Both of these articles were first broadcast in 2012. Now it's over to you, Clive. Was Guy Gibson killed by friendly fire? Although this is not a radio topic, 
I'm sure that very few, if any, REOTC old timers who lived through World War II would not have heard of Wing Commander Guy Gibson, VC, DSO and Bar, DFC and Bar, who led the famous bouncing bomb Dam Busters raid on German dams. 617 Squadron, commanded by Wing Commander Guy Gibson, was a Lancaster bomber squadron based at RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire, specially established to destroy the Ruhr dams. Although 617 Squadron subsequently flew many other missions, the Dam Busters raid, codenamed Operation Chastise, was the only one led by Gibson. Prior to Chastise, Gibson had already achieved an outstanding operational record, but this was eclipsed by the success of this raid, which not only gave him a place in history, but saw him awarded the Victoria Cross the highest medal that can be bestowed upon British and Commonwealth forces for gallantry in the, force, in the face of the enemy. It made him the most highly decorated pilot in the RAF and a national hero. Gibson could have seen out the rest of the war from a desk, but, as in the past, he wanted to be back on operational duty. He managed to get a post at a Lincolnshire bomber base at East Kirkby on a strictly non-operational basis. It would have been a serious blow to British morale and a boost for German propaganda if he'd been killed or captured as a prisoner of war. Air Vice Marshal Cochrane and Commander of Chief of Bomber Command Bomber Harris knew this, but after persistent pestering from Gibson, they decided to let him lead a bomber squadron into Germany. On the 19th of September 1944, Gibson, in a mosquito, led a huge force of 227 Lancaster bombers and 10 mosquitoes in an attack on railways and industrial targets at Wright and Munchengladbach in Germany. They faced little opposition from enemy planes and were returning over the Netherlands when Wing Commander Gibson's plane came down. Mystery and controversy have surrounded his crash ever since. Although his mosquito was seen plunging into the ground at Steenbergen in Holland, and parts of his remains were later found by the Dutch. Gibson's death was suppressed from the press for about three months because the Germans would have had a field day knowing they'd shot down a hero of the German dam raids. Over the years, a variety of theories have been put forward regarding Gibson's death, including that he flew into the ground, possibly suffering from exhaustion, that he was unfamiliar with mosquitoes, and forgot to flip the switch that turned on the second petrol tank and simply ran out of fuel, that he saw a train and, convinced that it was carrying ammunition, flew low to machine gun it, was hit in the fuel tank and crashed in flames, that he buzzed a Lancaster to see if the gunners were awake and was accidentally shot down by friendly fire, or even that it was sabotage. However, it seems that the truth about Gibson's death may now have emerged, according to a recent BBC and London The Telegraph newspaper item, which was picked up and reprinted in some of the Australian media. Nearly 70 years on, a British airman's confession has emerged that he was the one who shot down the plane after mistaking it for a German aircraft. Mr James Cutler, a World War II researcher, has said that he has a cassette tape given to him by the airman's widow in which a British airman admits to shooting down Gibson. Mr Cutler, who's been researching Wing Commander Gibson for a new Dam Busters film, claimed the taped account has now solved the mystery. Mr Cutler said the cassette was recorded by Sergeant Bernard McCormack prior to his death in 1992. Sergeant McCormack was in Wing Commander Gibson's formation of Lancasters and Mosquitoes on the 19th of September 1944 during the raid over Germany. On the tape, Sergeant McCormack, who later became the mayor of Holyhead in North Wales, admits to bringing down Wing Commander Gibson's twin-engined single-rudder mosquito after mistaking it for a Junkers 88. He said he instinctively opened fire, loosing off 600 rounds of machine gun fire, bringing it down over the Dutch town of Steenbergen. The realisation that the plane was an Allied aircraft only dawned on Sergeant McCormack the next day when he and his crew were debriefed by RAF intelligence and it was revealed that he had actually shot down Wing Commander Gibson and his navigator, squadron leader Jim Warwick DFC. 
Racked with guilt, Sergeant McCormack kept quiet about what had happened that night, but left a taped confession of the incident, which he gave to his wife before he died in 1992. Mr. Cutler has also unearthed a previously classified combat report in the National Archives by the crew of Sergeant McCormack's Lancaster, which describes the attack. He said coordinates given in the, in the classified combat report backed up the pilot's account. Mr. Cutler also said, when I first heard the tape, I thought, it's just a story told by old comrades. But then when we found the documents in the National Archives, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I realized one of the great mysteries of World War II may have been answered. Mr. Cutler is 100% satisfied Wing Commander Guy Gibson was killed by friendly fire and 99.9% .9 sure that he was shot down by Sergeant Bernard McCormack's Lancaster. However, Roger Crisp from the RAF Scampton Historical Museum is quoted as saying, Gibson was very egotistical. He liked to be the best at everything and he was impatient. He did not do a proper conversion course on the Mosquito and when he went on his last mission his navigator had not flown a Mosquito before and one of the navigator's tasks was to change the fuel tank over. An RAF spokesman said a long time has elapsed since Wing Commander Guy Gibson and his navigator went down. We simply don't have the facts available to corroborate this idea and it is therefore one of a number of theories about why the aircraft crashed. Thanks very much, Clive. You are listening to VK3OTN and associated relay stations. VK3OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club, Australia, Incorporated, with the monthly news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club. The Eiffel Tower and its early radio. This is an extract from an article submitted to OTN magazine by Lloyd Butler, VK5BR, RAOTC member number 1495. Think of Paris and you think of the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower of Paris was named after its designer, engineer Gustave Eiffel. The structure was built between 1887 and 1889 as an entrance arch for the Exposition Universelle at 1889 World's Fair, marking the centennial celebration of the French Revolution. It was opened on the 6th of May, 1889. The tower initially stood 300 metres tall. Built of pig iron, a very pure form of structural iron, the entire tower weighed approximately 10,000 tonnes. Up until 1930, it was the tallest structure in the world. In 1957, a steel mast was added at the top for radio use, such as FM and television, which increased the height to 324 metres. Lloyd's initial interest was the impressive long-wave aerial system, which, until around 1950, hung from the top of the tower, and the low-frequency radio transmission equipment which operated into it. Lloyd's first visit to Paris and the Eiffel Tower was in 1977, but by that time the long wave aerial had long been taken down. In fact, he only learned about the aerial when he first did some research in the 1980s. It's interesting to note that the Eiffel Tower was initially given an approval for its erection to last just 20 years. At the end of the 20 years, in 1909, the city of Paris had planned to tear it down but it was ultimately saved because of its antenna use for military and other communications applications. It's also interesting that during World War II in 1944, Hitler gave orders to his general in occupied Paris to destroy the Eiffel Tower. Fortunately, the general never carried out those orders. Like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the tower has to be regularly painted to prevent rust. This is done every seven years and it takes 50 to 60 tonnes of paint. In the early 1900s, a set of aerial wires ran from the top of the Eiffel Tower to anchors on the Avenue de Saffron and the Champ de Mars. The aerial wires were connected to long-wave transmitters in small bunkers. However, 
1909, a permanent underground radio centre was built near the south pillar of the tower, and the radio centre is still there today. The aerial wires remained until the 1950s. The specific date of removal has been given as 1957, but one writer claimed the long-wave antenna cables were removed as early as 1946. The individual antenna wires were fed via taps partway up the aerial wire. It is estimated that those wires were around 500 metres long, but were still short compared to the long wavelength used for their early spark transmitter. Connected in at the end, radiation resistance would have been very low. Very large insulators were used to isolate the tower from the very high voltages of the antenna wires. These high voltages would have developed because of the electrically shortened loaded antenna and the high power used. Early radio communication made use of long waves and needed large aerial system. By the time the 1950s had arrived, radio communication and other services such as broadcasting and television had gradually moved on to shorter waves and different types of antenna systems. Gustav Eiffel was also active in developing radio communications. On the 5th of November 1898, he and another experimenter set up a transmitter on the third platform of the Eiffel Tower and succeeded in making the first radio contact from the tower to Pantheon, four kilometres away. It would have been long waves or low frequency and one wonders what aerial he would have used. Lloyd thinks he would have just dropped a long wire straight down from the platform and operated against the iron structure of the tower. Lee de Forest is recorded in history as the inventor of the three element vacuum tube or Audion. He travelled to Paris in 1908 and was given permission to conduct experimental radio transmissions from the top of the Eiffel Tower. These were heard as far as Marseille 805 kilometres away. In 1910, radio from the tower became part of the International Time Service. From May 1910, the first regular time signal could be heard from a distance of 5,200 kilometres. In 1913, the Paris Observatory, using the Eiffel Tower as an antenna, exchanged wireless signals with the United States Naval Observatory in Arlington, Virginia to carry out a scientific experiment. The objective was to measure the difference in longitude between Washington and Paris. In 1914, during World War I, the tower aerial was used for reception as well as transmission and played a big part in intercepting the enemy's messages. They called it the Big Ear. French radio made use of the tower from 1918 and for television from 1957. The first broadcast from the tower was made by French radio in November 1921. The first television tests were made from the tower in 1925 and the first 60-line television program was broadcast in 1935. A little about the early transmitters was contained in one of the issues of the New Harmsworth Self-Educator, written by W. W. Whiffen. Photographs included were especially obtained for the encyclopedia by arrangement with the French government. Unfortunately, the printed quality of those photographs is not very good. The Harmsworth publication was not dated, but considering that the main transmitter was a high-powered spark unit, and there were several early types of valve transmitter, Lloyd figured that the era concerned was the early 1920s. The spark transmitter operated on a wavelength of 2,600 metres, or 115 kilohertz. The spark transmissions were sent out mainly for the issue of time signals and meteorological observations. The time signals were sent out every morning at 10.30 a.m. GMT, the transmitter power was not given, but the aerial current was quoted as around 80 amps, delivering sufficient power to be received in England on a crystal set receiver. The article discussed a little about the power sources which they had available. The spark transmitter was fed with 1000 Hz AC. To understand this, spark transmitters don't use continuous waves. 
They send out wave trains of damped oscillations initiated by the spark. The spark initiates the charge of energy into the tuned circuit, set at the frequency of transmission, and the waveform decays due to the natural oscillation and energy loss in the tuned circuit. The tuning inductance consisted of 40 turns of brass pipe at a 90 centimeter diameter. The tuning capacitors mounted in oil-filled tanks consisted of flat aluminium plates with glass dielectrics and had a total capacity of 0.55 microfarads. Another Eiffel Tower transmitter described in the Harmsworth Educator article was a pulse and arc unit, which operated from 1000 volts DC and delivered a power of 60 kilowatts. Not a lot of detail was given, except that this transmitter was used during World War I for a military purpose. As distinct from the spark transmitters, which generated damp waves, the arc transmitter, introduced by Veldemar Poulsen, was one of the first inventions to send continuous waves. However, the characteristic of the arc was such that frequencies above 250 kHz were difficult to produce. Two other valve transmitters were briefly mentioned as part of the radio installation of that time. The first was a one kilowatt transmitter using six valves apparently fed from a high frequency alternator which was used for radio telegraphy. And the second was a five kilowatt valve AM transmitter used for broadcasting. Built as a feature for a World Expo in 1889 and a monument to the French Revolution, it was anticipated that the Eiffel Tower would be dismantled after 20 years. But after more than 120 years, it is still there today. Once the tallest structure in the world, it is visited daily by thousands of tourists who queue up for their turn in the lifts to ascend the tower. One might say that it has survived beyond the initial 20 years because it is a national monument and a great tourist attraction. However, it has also survived because of its value as a tall structure to support vital radio aerials. The long wave aerial array is long gone, but the mast at the top still supports numerous aerials for FM broadcasting and television on both VHF and UHF. Thanks to Lloyd Butler, VK5BR, for that interesting historical item. You're listening to VK3OTN, the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia. Perf Luncheons The popular and well-attended monthly luncheons for ROTC members and friends in and around the Perth area are held on the second Tuesday of each month. The VK6 RATC group have a new venue, the Woodbridge Hotel, East of Guildford. Reports indicate the hospitality to be excellent. The Perth group meet at 11.30am for lunch at 12 midday. This is not a buffet meal, but excellent food in both pensioner and standard portions are available. We would like to place orders at 12 midday, so please don't be late. This information is courtesy of Phil. VK6ZKO, whose contact details can be found on the club's website. In keeping with tradition, we conclude this broadcast with a short story. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales. The teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though it was a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Irritated, the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was physically impossible. The little girl said, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. The teacher asked, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl replied, then you ask him. And that humorous story was supplied by Ron VK3AFW. That's all we have for you this month, and we hope you found something of interest. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you will join in the callbacks where callbacks are taken.
The next IOT Seek News and Information broadcast will take place on the first Monday of next month, on the same frequencies and at the same times as today, with the exception of January. If you have missed all a part of this broadcast or you just want to listen to it again, it is available for download from the IOTC website. Simply go to www.raotc.org.au. Again the website URL is www.raotc.org.au. On the right hand side is the main menu. Click on VK3OT and broadcasts and will be able to see the various times and frequencies of the VK3OTN. Transmissions by all of our volunteers, provided of course a volunteer is available. Down towards the bottom of the page is the current and previous five broadcasts for you to listen to. Sometimes the relay station is an automated broadcast, for example a repeater, when no operator is available to take callbacks. Other times the volunteer operator suffers from very heavy local queue iron and callbacks are not always possible. Many operators need a small amount of time to switch from playing a recorded file to using a microphone. Please be mindful of this. This is VK3OT and signing clear from today's news and information session. 73 from the IOTC broadcast team.